Okay, welcome, 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 <laughs> welcome. This is such a wonderful gathering of people. The energy in here, I've just, uh, one of my students is sitting in the front row and I said I'm going to cancel class this afternoon and we're just going to stay here and party, okay? Because <laughs> the energy here, people who have been, and at the end we're going to ask how many people have been to Mallard and how many years, Gene Replinger's request. But first, welcome. Thank you for joining us today for our talk, Mallard Island and the Legacy of Ernest Oberholzer. I am Marianne Zarzana, Associate Professor of English at Southwest Minnesota State University and also the Director of the Creative Writing Program. And I'm Emily Deaver, Professor of Environmental Science at SMSU and I'm also the Coordinator for the Undergraduate Research Conference. So first I'd like to thank Michelle Leininger, the director of the Marshall Lyon County Library, Paula Namus, who has helped promote, and also Lou Ann Anderson, who helped us set up the technology yeah. today, which we really appreciate. And just for letting us use this beautiful space. We, we just love it. Um, we'll also be giving the same talk tonight at 7 p.m. at SMSU in CH217. So if you know anyone who was not able to come today, Please let them know about tonight. Also, Ryan Meyerberg, Meyerberg. Meyerberg uh, from Studio One TV is recording it, and this will be on 6.30 um, Saturday and Sunday. So you can watch it and share it with people that way as well. Um, so I'd like to start out uh, with a poem that I wrote on Mallard Island, and it is dedicated to a man sitting here in the front row, Darwin Dice. So this will be an introduction for you to um, kind of put you on the ground if you haven't already been there. And if you've already been there, I hope this kind of sends you back. So this is for Darwin Dice, who suggested to all of us when I was on the island with him that we go barefoot as much as we can. And I'm kind of a tenderfoot, but I really appreciated that, just to really pull the island energy up in. So this is called the bones of Mallard Island. If you want to, close your eyes and really send yourself back there. And uh, here we go. The bones of Mallard Island. I walk along the spine of this magic island, feet bare on warm slate gray boulders, embedded deep in earth, rocks like vertebrae, strong, grooved, exposed to sun, rain, snow and wind. I walk along the spine of this seeker's island, pull its energy up into my own bones, stand tall, align myself with more expansive spheres, feel my heart open wider like the wild roses along the path. I walk along the spine of this musical island, Listen to bird song, white throated sparrows, wind whisper in birch, cedar, pine, <coughs> waves that lap along the shore, laughter that spills from a canoe. I walk along the spine of this sacred island, sit alone in the drum room, read in Ober's study, nap and dream perched in birdhouse. And at day's end, gather at table in the Wanagon. Later, circle around the campfire, under the stars, to feed my body, my soul. You can open your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> I hope that took you back. Yeah, you got to open your eyes because you're going to see some amazing, amazing pictures. So, um, So this is, you'll see a lot of Emily Deaver's pictures here. Um, Emily got a new camera and she took a class from Roger Schrader last spring. So even though she's a scientist, she really tapped into her artist side here. <laughs> the story of Ernest Oberholzer is how we're going to start because without Ernest Oberholzer, and I'm going <laughs> to use his nickname because it's less of a tongue twister, he was known as Ober. The story of Ernest Oberholzer might just be the greatest uncelebrated environmental story in North America, in North American history. 
We have too few environmental heroes to allow one so important as Ernest Oberholzer to slip from our collective memory. And that's a quote from Joe Paddock's book. Joe Paddock has been, Joe and Nancy Paddock, both writers, poets, had been up to Mallard, and he is the, he wrote the biography of Ernest Oberholzer, Keeper of the Wild, and that is um, something that you can check out of the library here, and I have a copy with me as well. Um, I read it for the first time this summer, and I highly recommend it. But um, this is why Emily and I are here today, is because we want more people to know the story. A lot of you know the story, but we want more people to know the story. He fought to protect the environment, to, to protect Rainy Lake, to protect nature, and we need more environmental warriors now today than ever before. This is not just a story of the past, it's a story of the present. So, quickly, Ernest, or over, he was born in Davenport, Iowa, 1884. His parents, Rose and Henry, his parents divorced. His younger brother had an accident and died uh, when Ernest was seven, and so it was just over and his mother and uh, he attended school a block away. He often credited the Irish grave digger Thomas Burke with instilling in him a curiosity and love for nature. Um, one year to live, near the end of high school, Ernest suffered from rheumatic fever, and he was told by his doctor that he had only one year to live, and that would affect him the rest of his life, because when you only have one year to live, you kind of live full on, right? So. Um, he went on to Harvard, but instead of, and this is in the early 1900s, instead of going maybe the route of, you are expected as a man to be a doctor, uh, a lawyer, a businessman, he thought, what the heck, I'll study what I really love. And so he studied landscape architecture, which might not have been practical, speaking as an English major, <laughs> we don't do the practical thing, but when you do what you love, it's really the best thing. And then he uh, traveled up north to northern Minnesota, fell in love with the Boundary Waters, and decided to um, have some adventures there. Uh, so he received his undergraduate degree from Harvard in 1907. He studied architecture, landscape architecture, with Frederick Law Olmsted, Jr., who was the son of the, uh, Frank Frederick Law um, Olmsted, who designed Central Park. And then he traveled around uh, Europe with some of his friends. Um, he had an epic journey to Hudson Bay in 1912. Um, he went with an Ojibwe guide and friend, Billy McGee, and Billy was 51 at the time, you can see him there, and Ober was 28. Um, he had a Graflex camera, they paddled from June to November 2000 uh, miles, many unmapped, and uh, Ober created maps with his watch and compass. Uh, they missed a steamboat, they ended up going down, um, you know, uh, much longer down Lake Winnipeg in November. And you can read about this um, in uh, his, his uh, journals that he kept. Miraculously, they survived. So did 150 photographs, good maps, and a lifetime of stories. He was also a photographer. Um, this is one of his uh, moose that he captured. Very good. Uh, you can imagine how hard that would be to capture. You're in a canoe, but he had the help of his uh, skillful partner. Um, his mother was quite the trooper. She was a concert pianist and kind of a, you know, someone who was used to a little less rugged living, but since it was just her and over, she went up to Rainy Lake and lived up there. Here he is in 1938. And then um, Frances Elizabeth Andrews was one of his good friends. She helped organize food, cooked for several years, rented the front house. And then in later years, he and Francis uh, wrote letters to each other, and they were um, neighbors on Rainy Lake. And when she died, Francis left a very large portion of her estate to Oberholzer, and that in part caused him to form the Oberholzer Foundation, which continues on. Uh, violin was always important to uh, Ernest Oberholzer. His mother was a concert <coughs> pianist, as I said. He would actually bring his violin on canoe trips with him. And here he is um, in 1930s, he often had, you can't kind of see off to the lower right hand here, the little Jack Russell Terrier at his side. Um, he had the company of many friends for weeks at a time, including Anishinaabe from the Rainy Lake region. Um, and he actually learned how to speak Anishinaabe as well. Uh, where he's standing, this is called the Wanagan. you'll see some more pictures of this. 
Uh, that was the floating kitchen for lumberjacks, but they bought that and they had it permanently moored on um, Mallard Island. And for all of us who have gone there, we all have very good memories. Some of us of drinking, <coughs> drinking our cocktails out on the porch there, um, cooking inside, and uh, just a great gathering place. Uh, Rainy Lake, uh, here he is out canoeing. He was always planning one canoe trip or another. And then his home on Mallard Island. He lived here for 40 years. Um, he designed these unique structures with um, Emil, help of Emil Johnson, a Swedish builder. And he used his landscape architecture studies to design the island. And how um, just the, the buildings, the way that the people can interact with each other, and really bringing together wilderness, civilization, nature, and culture. Also, it's called the University of the Wilderness because he collected over 12,000 books, art prints, maps, records, and sheet music. And these are in all the buildings. There's one building that's called the library, but there's books everywhere. And Jean Replinger can tell us more about that. Um, she was really responsible for rescuing those and getting them um, recorded, um, indexed. Um, he became an advocate for the preservation of the Border Lakes region, which led to the Boundary um, Waters canoe area. So even though he was a Renaissance man, he loved to read, he loved music and everything, he really, because of the situation up there, he evolved into a protector of the wilderness. And uh, he was in a nine-year court battle with Edward Wellington Bacchus, that's um, the man at the top. He was a lumber baron. Um, his vision, Bacchus's vision, was to dam up Rainy Lake. And he said this will be good for the economy. And uh, so Ernest Oberholzer took off the flat, flannel shirt that you saw in some other pictures, put on the suit, and would go off to Washington. And he organized uh, some of his friends, Chicago and Minneapolis lawyers, and really fought this um, very hard. He was uh, named the first head of the Quetico Superior Council and he was a proponent of multi-uses of land with careful zoning. And the thing that's cut off on the bottom is yes. that he was one of the founders of the Wilderness Society. Yeah. Along with a lot of familiar names, like Aldo Leopold. Yes, yeah, there you go. <laughs> uh, this is a quote, such lands link us with the primeval past, promising sanctuary for all time to unborn multitudes and that um, is why we're here today again. Uh, we would like to shine the light now on Jean Sanford Replinger. Many of you in this room know her. She's right here in the front row. Uh, she is an emeritus faculty at SMSU, and she cataloged over 12,000 books, and then she became the Mallard Island Program Director, so organizing these weeks like the week that Emily and I uh, were on this year, um, which was centering through the earth and the arts. And uh, there's been, you know, a music writers, um, poets weeks, whatever you want. I was part of one called Healers Evolving. But the idea is for people to come together, to have that solitude, to have some structured events, activities, but also just to let the island feed you in whatever way um, that it, you need to be fed. And so you can see some of the books here. Um, it's just an amazing situation. Um, also, Jean is the book editor of Bound for the Barrens. She edited that with Nancy Paddock. You see a cover of it here. And so that was the journal of Ober and Billy's 2,000-mile uh, canoe voyage in Hudson Bay. So um, you might be interested in purchasing that. Uh, she is an emeritus trustee of the Ernest Oberholzer Foundation, and Jean has been called a modern visionary of the wilderness, and that's David Pelly, author of The Old Way North. And many, because of Jean, she has connected many SMSU people with Mallard. Um, maybe we could have a show of hands. How many people here, um, SMSU people here, um, have been to Mallard? Jim Zarzana? <laughs> so, yes? Uh, so Bill Holm is one from our English department, um, Dan Wall, he's also in our English department, but um, so many people. 
Uh, Mallard Island today, it's a very small, kind of a splinter of an island. It's 1,100 feet long, 200 feet wide. It's considered a study and retreat center from late May to early September. There, as I mentioned, week-long programs. There's also work weeks where it's planting the flowers, cleaning up any damage from the winter, repairing the books. And then also um, the indigenous peoples and kindred spirits, that's part of the mission statement is that they are try. very much yeah, a part sure. of the Feel mission free. and it's the life button of button. the island. Um, what you see here is the Japanese house that's on the far western tip of the island. It's not that so much some place where you live oh, or stay overnight, but you can see it's enclosed. So if the mosquitoes are bad, you can go there and look at the stars or the northern lights. Um, also, there's a little room at the center. Uh, people use that for art projects or writing projects. And the ecological caring capacity is only 12 people. It's a very fragile ecosystem. So when we plan a week, it's for 10 people, and then there's two caretakers. So ways to visit Mallard, the work weeks, uh, program weeks focused on Ober's legacy, and then um, weeks sponsored by a group with a vision such as ours, which was centering through the earth and the arts. And then the other one that I went on, um, Healers Evolving. This is the drum room. And this is one of the most sacred objects on the island. Um, we can talk about it more. Maybe, Jean, you can talk about it more. But uh, the drum room, this is uh, called Grandmother Drum. And when a lot of sacred objects were being taken away from uh, the Anishinaabe, they asked um, Ober if he would uh, take that under his care. And so it's, it's very much revered and a gathering place for all of us uh, when we go there. And this is our week uh, that I, I hosted it, July 23rd through 29. Um, Emily was there, Jim Zarzana was there. Um, as I said earlier, the University of the Wilderness, uh, we wanted people to tap into that. Um, books kind of fall off, the, the um, figuratively fall off the shelf at you. And um, as I said, for me, I had heard about this book and I had read excerpts of it, but it was like, no, this is, I'm gonna spend the week reading this writing my poetry, um, going out on canoe rides, but um, you just let the island speak to you. So what I wanted to create was that sense of community and cross-fertilization and um, personal exploration. So we had artists, we had a composer, environmental advocates, musicians, outdoor enthusiasts, poets, and um, Emily was, as she says, our token scientist. <laughs> and here you can see our group up there. Um, Larry Gavin is up upper left corner. He's a wonderful um, SMSU. Darwin. 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 Darwin's in the front row. Back, back row. Back row. The back row. Back row. Um, Alicia Johnson off to the upper right there. She uh, was a Schwann's chair uh, chair in business a while back. Uh, let's see. There's Emily. Um, in the front row, Anne uh, Reed, she's an artist, and over to the left there, Mary Dorr, she was one of the caretakers. Edie Barrett, uh, she's an artist and writer. Lauren Carlson, a poet up in Dawson. Mary Swallow Holm, uh, she was one of our caretakers. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the Wanigan. You can kind of see how it's long and um, narrow, and, you know, all the dishes are right there, and it's um, it looks like Jim Zarzan is holding forth. Everybody's kind of laughing there and looking at him. Um, but just, we each take our turns making a meal in pairs, and uh, you've never had better food than on Mallard Island. Um, here up in the upper left-hand corner, Alicia Johnson, who is a, a gourmet cook and chef, uh, that's a chocolate ganache with wild blueberries picked on the island. It was absolutely Delicious. stunning. <laughs> um, Muriel Runhold, she, what did you, you made something outrageous when you were there that we were like, I can't. Whatever you ate, you're still alive. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> but it's it just, uh, the canoeing, of course, is a favorite. Uh, there's Jim and Marianne. Thank you, uh, Emily, for taking the picture. Um, this is Rose's piano, and that's in Cedar Bark House, which was a floating brothel that um, uh, overbought, and that's permanently moored on the island, but that's where Rosa lived. There's an a old, uh, what's it called, a Victrola. grandma? Victrola that we played. It just old 78 that, that night, we felt like we were going back, like, I don't know, 50 years, 100 years in time. It was just incredible. 
and then here people are hanging out on the wand again. And now I'm going to pass this over to Emily now. <laughs> Thank you. So as Marianne mentioned, this was my first visit to the island. Um, didn't know what to expect, didn't know anyone except Jim and Marianne. Um, and believe it or not, I'm kind of a chicken, so I was a little apprehensive about that. Um, but my colleague and I, Tom Dilly, at the university have been studying lichen recently. And so one of the things I was really looking forward to was exploring the lichen at Mallard Island. Because lichen in the prairie, or we've got some, but it's pretty dry environment, so we don't have nearly as many. Um, and so I'm going to teach you a little bit about lichen. Um, many of you probably know that lichen is our classic example of a mutualistic symbiotic relationship. It's actually two organisms. An algae, which of course is an aquatic plant, um, on the inside, and a fungus that then creates a house for that algae and keeps it nice and moist. And the algae then photosynthesizes and produces enough food for both organisms. And they're so closely intertwined that they look like a single entity to most of us. And so they come in three different growth forms. Um, crustos on the left are when they look like they're really tightly oppressed to the rock, almost like painted on sometimes. Um, the middle one is then a folio, so leafy type forms of lichen. And then the right hand side is our fruticose that have fruiting bodies that stand up um, on stalks. And I'm sorry, our projector's chopping off uh, the bottom of these because they have some fun names. So the one on the left is cinder lichen. Um, the middle one is a rock tripe. There are many kinds of rock tripe with that um, big leafy form. And then a reindeer lichen on the right side. And not only was I studying the lichen, but then of course I wanted to share what I was learning with people. So I kind of inflicted my uh, enthusiasm on our group. Um, but also then tried to think of a way to pass that information on to future visitors. And so I created a lichen hike. Um, and I put a copy over on the table that you can look at. Um, and it's a self-guided hike that people can go and then find and um, enjoy some of these lichen that are growing, particularly on the granite rocks on the island. So of course you don't want to put signs or permanent stickers of any kind, so I had to figure out how can I describe where to go look and find these lichen? And so I um, chose to do it here on this wall, which is on the east end of the island. The sun shower is here, and there's a plaque on the wall. And several of you have mentioned that this is new from when you were initially out there. Um, but it's a great spot because just in that one section of wall, I could easily identify 13 different species of lichen. And so I wrote up my descriptions and then um, the poets and all those writers were great sports and they came and, and did a run through for me. Um, and they could actually find everything. And then they also gave me some good suggestions on descriptions instead of dusty, call it ivory and things like that. Um, and so I included photographs then of the close up shot of the individual lichen so people could see what I was trying to describe and then match that up um, with what they were seeing on the rock. Uh, so it looks pretty obvious when you're looking by itself like that, but in reality it's growing more like that. <laughs> and so you have this fabulous mix of many, many different kinds of lichen. And so this picture has actually got probably six or seven species. And of course this rock tripe in the middle is pretty easily recognizable. There are many kinds of rock tripe, but at least you can get close and know that's a rock tripe. And then the bright orange is our fire dot lichen, granite fire dot. Grows really well in that region, really obvious. But then you have this lumpy cauliflower looking thing that's called a rock posy. And then you have some leafy green things. So there are lots of different lichen if you just take time to sit and look at that um, any given spot on the island. And of course, canoeing, you see huge amounts of lichen growing on these big rock walls. And again, this is our granite fire dot, but then these lumpy things are different kinds of rock tripe as well. And they're fun ones that grow on soil. The main ones that I was concentrating on were the ones growing on the rock, but 
There's some fun ones I included that are easily recognizable, like this little red-capped one called British Soldiers. Grows on soil, is only about an inch or an inch and a half tall. And then they grow on tree trunks as well. And so here's a combination of moss up here and then these nice little stalks with little pixie cup tops. There are a bunch of different species of cladonia that are the fruticose with those little pixie cups. And then the reindeer lichen on the right, several species of that, and another species of cladonia here. And so these are just little bitty guys growing down in the soil mixed in with different kinds of moss and other vegetation. And so those are pine needles that you see lying next to them. <coughs> so one of the things that uh, Marianne mentioned is this idea of um, having a real mix of people out there. And the first morning, I went and sat on the stone bridge and was just reveling in all the lichen. So I was really just examining up close the stone bridge. And Ann Reed, um, in the pink shirt here, is an artist. And she came down and sat next to me. We didn't know each other, so we spent some time getting to know each other. And um, of course, I was talking about lichens because she's like, what are you doing? <laughs> um, and as a result of that, she then took a picture and started working on a painting that week. And so this is at the end of the week and she's showing us on her phone the photo that she took um, and then the painting that she had created as a result of that and then went home and finished up that painting. It took her several months. But it was pretty exciting that she had lichen in the foreground as, a, as the main focus of that painting. And then of course you can see this is the edge of that stone bridge and in the background back here, you can see that granite fire dot lichen on the, the big face of the rock there as well. So she did a beautiful job capturing all the different kinds of lichen growing on that stone wall. And one of my other goals for the week, as Marianne mentioned, um, I had gotten a, a really nice camera and then I took this uh, short photography class from Roger Schrader, learned a ton of stuff, but didn't have any time to apply the things I'd learned. And so this was a wonderful opportunity to be able to try to do that, spend time with my camera. And I got really lucky. I took a lot of photos, but I got some good ones. So I'm going to show you a few more. But um, there is a book on the table over there that I did create after we got home, um, put photos together, and um, gave that to Marianne as a thank you. And so the colors are better in the book than they are showing up here. Tell um, them how early you got up. <laughs> well, yeah, <laughs> I had to get up, you know, four o'clock to get the sunrise photos, but it was worth it. Um, and we had some just incredible days. And uh, this photo was thanks to Darwin Dice. We went out canoeing one morning, ended up being out, I think, three hours, three and a half hours, something like that, because it was just absolutely gorgeous and we paddled all around um, the lake and the islands and so I was able to get some nice shots from a distance looking at the island and you can see it was just calm as could be. The colors in this one with the red were because of sunrise um, so it wasn't fall colors it was just early morning light and this was another early morning shot. And I worked hard to try to get a spider web. There wasn't ever any dew on the spider web, which is something you can often focus on to get a photo, but I finally, finally figured out how to do that. And then many of you recognize the red squirrels who never stand still, but uh, again, got lucky and got a shot of one. I did not get the snowshoe hare that one morning came walking down the path and we kind of saw each other and I was busy looking at the rabbit rather than using my camera, which is great. <laughs> but, uh, and this is the stone bridge that I was sitting on the first morning, which of course goes out to the Japanese house. And, and that's where Anne, the painter, sat most days and, and worked on her painting. And so it was really a remarkable group, real community that um, we came together and really energy and lots of creative things going on, lots of writing by poets, um, and, and just a remarkable, remarkable week. 
Oh. Music by Darwin Dice on the flute. <laughs> yeah. Lots of music, lots of poetry, lots of reading, lots of sharing. And so Marianne and I really wanted to share with you then information about Ernest Oberholzer and his vision for the protection and appreciation of nature. Um, we also wanted to promote his legacy, um, to really try to convey how important it is to have spaces like Mallard Island where you can go and just be in nature, to really reconnect and renew and get refreshed. Um, and hopefully we've given you a small taste of what is unique and enriching and, and really encourage you to do that, to out, go out and enjoy nature. And so if you want to know more, you can go to the Mallard Island website and always take donations. <laughs> <laughs> yep, it's just eober.org. And we'd be happy to answer any questions. It's also on Facebook, Mallard Island and Rainy Lake. So like, go on Facebook and like it. Any questions? Oh, we're going to make them raise hands on how many people have been oh, there. Oh, yes. How many people have been to Mallard Island? So <laughs> one, Most two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, it, twelve, thirteen. <laughs> okay. And how many times have you been Carol, to Carol, you've Island? been there ten, right? Yeah, I've been there three times. <laughs> One. <laughs> and You're Jean's been there more than we can count. Huh? Yes. Can you? Do you have any <laughs> idea how many times you've been there? I mean, summers. I mean, because I've been in and out. Oh, I right. suppose twenty-five. Wow. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> she holds the record. Well, I have two questions. One's for Jean, and then one goes back into some pictures. Okay. So, how long did it take you to catalog all those books, Jean? Well, we're, uh, first of all, I didn't do it alone. We were, we were six the first summer. And uh, foolishly, uh, without knowing how many books were there, <laughs> I promised that that's what we would do. We would work, uh, we would work five hours a day, four weeks a summer, until we had them all cataloged. And my husband said, "Well, how many are there?" And I said, well, "I don't know." He said, "Well, you shouldn't promise that. You maybe can't do that." <laughs> and I said, "Oh well." So I called them up and I said, "How many books yet?" Well, we don't know. I don't know. So I, I chartered a plane and flew up with the Morandis, and uh, we eyeballed for about half a day and looked at each other and said, I think there's 9,000. So I called them, do you have 9,000 books? Uh, I don't know. Does that count the 25 boxes on the mainland? I said, no. Uh -oh. Well, there were 14,000, so we did it in two summers. And the first summer, this was when computers were brand new. We brought a technician and two computers up. And uh, we had the computer technician recording what we were finding. And after the first day, the next morning, it was all gone. Oh. Nothing on the recording. Oops. So we started all over again. The second day, all day long, we recorded the books we were finding. And this is recording author, you know, a, a chart of information about the book. All gone again. Oh. I said, we're not doing this anymore. <laughs> right. So I went to town and bought, bought card catalog, just, well, index cards. And we Old school. Index cards. <laughs> yeah. anyway, wow. I tell this story because it's kind of cute. So then we had all of this on index cards written by six different people with different kinds of handwriting and so on. And uh, really brought them back to the winter tried to create some truth about what was there. And the only person that we could find to do it was a, a seventh or eighth grade young lady, well read, but not that well read. <laughs> so we got books on things like uh, Marco Polo, the Venetian, I mean, uh, the, what became Marco Polo, the vacation. <laughs> and uh, we got uh, seven signs of God became seven signs of cod. <laughs> Close enough. Close enough. <laughs> all sorts, so they had to be corrected. So eventually we, we eliminated duplicates. Mm. There are probably about that's still pretty amazing. Yeah. Well, they told me I couldn't do it. That was the wrong thing to say. Yeah. <laughs> and then my other, mm -hmm. if you can go backwards, mm -hmm. it was a close-up of lichen, and I think it was on a tree. Yeah, maybe there. So I'm thinking, sometimes do we, are we looking at moss, but we think, no, the other way around. Sometimes am I looking at lichen, but I think I'm looking at moss, 
And Could be. can you explain the difference between the two? No. Okay. <laughs> it's, there are so many, many kinds of lichen. Um, well, I was saying moss is moss in the shade, whereas obviously some Well, things, moist. It doesn't have to be shade necessarily. But lichen can... Lichen can, a, yeah. Um, you find... Moss is a plant? Yeah, it's moss a plant, is a plant. So it's, it's acting like grass. Or yeah. Um, and so the moss is going to tend to get most of its nutrients through the roots, whereas lichen get their nutrients mostly from the atmosphere, which is why they grow on, you know, concrete and various other things like that. Um, and you eat it? There is some question, of course, the reindeer, lichen, caribou, and things do eat up in the tundra. Um, do you eat the rock tripe? There are discussions of people having eaten rock tripe, but not a great diet because there's not much to it, but, but supposedly won't hurt you. Dog grill some rock tripe up there over the fire. <laughs> yeah, no, we didn't do that. We had much better things to eat. <laughs> but yeah, sure. So my guess is the, the lichen will survive a lot longer than the, the human race probably. Well, many species of lichen are very, very sensitive to air pollution. So maybe, maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. As another scientist, <laughs> um, is there some component about the recent discovery of yeast being a possible third symbiotic partner in lichen? Yeah, there it, absolutely there is a third partner in many, many species. Right. Yeah, yep, that's exactly right. Uh, so a recent article um, found that not only is there an algae and a fungus in most lichen, but there's a third partner in that association that's a yeast. And they found that in a whole group of, they're not sure it's in all lichen, but certainly found it as a major component in uh, a large number of lichen. And so now they're trying to understand that relationship um, and they think that yeast has some role in helping to ward off competitors. Mm -hmm. Different people have been on the island have said that when, when I could see this orange lichen, mm -hmm. there was indication of pure air. Is that true? Yeah, because typically they are very sensitive to air pollution. So good, clean air. Take lots of deep breaths. Yeah. Yes? Yeah, I was watching National Geographic a while back and it was they discovered in a canyon in, in uh, uh, Australia a tree combination of a fir and a palm tree. Oh. Which is rather, you know. Odd combination, yeah. And then now it's for so they can breed. They uh huh. But anyways, are they doing anything about uh, pollinators? <laughs> Not much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. I was wondering, what's that, what's that uh, larger looking plant growing on the tree right in the top middle? This is a moss. It is a moss. Yeah. Right. How many mm -hmm. kinds of lichen are in this picture? How many species? Uh, gee, will it appear? Yes. 14. I see maybe six. There's several kinds of moss because the green fuzzy stuff down here is moss, but the little pixie cup things are lichen. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's just amazing because any given spot on Mallard, you know, on the ground, on tree trunks, on rocks, you can just stop. And if you take time and look, you just see more and more and more things. It's amazing. And that morning sitting on the bridge, I was busy looking at lichen. And then I stopped and went, wait, and pulled off a molt. So the exoskeleton shed from a dragonfly larvae. And it was one of the biggest molts I've ever seen. It was literally that size, um, where the larval stage had, had crawled out of the water and then shed its exoskeleton and, and uh, metamorphosed into the, the big dragonflies that we see, because there's some big dragonflies on the island. And it was just like, that's cool. You know, so it's just really looking and taking time to look. And there were just so many things, yeah. When I first started thinking about program, that this is one of the reasons that I brought in an ecologist to help me determine carrying capacity. Mm -hmm. Because it would be so easy to destroy so many things without even thinking anything about it at right. all. Right. Yeah. And that's, of course, one of the main blessings that is there. 
to let it be and learn from it as it right. is. Right. Yeah. But one of the directors that I had during that long time that I was there, um, one of the board members, excuse me, wanted me to, to get rid of all the weeds. Hmm. And I said, well, <laughs> Yeah, it's a plant out of place, yeah. <laughs> so it's, yeah. it's got a lot of lessons and they're hard for us to learn. Right. Because you're used to cleaning things up. You don't get yes. that like it, get that bridge so it looks better. Yes, yeah. That's when people take them off your tombstone. Yeah. I want you to leave them there. <laughs> no electricity? Uh, we, yeah. we did have electricity, but no running water. Not to begin with. The first two years was okay. And yeah. then I was thinking, looking at some of those pictures, I'll bet the island has some storm stories. Oh, yeah. Oh, well, we had, Jean, Jean. we had fabulous <laughs> weather when we were there. Yeah. But, yeah. We've been ran, uh, stranded there sometime. And yeah. a lot of trees down. We just have to be careful. We don't have a shelter yet. I worked on that for 20 uh -huh. years or so. <laughs> yeah. yeah. We just hope. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I mean, this is a question, I don't know, if all three of you might be able to be part of it. What do you guys think it would look like up there if Oberwoster had not gone and done the political battle oh. that he had? Done? What do you think it would look like in the area? <laughs> you think? Jean. Oh. Jean, you, Jean. Oh, well, yeah. Just the way the totally developed, yeah. Yeah. It, it'd, be yeah. it'd be underwater. Yeah. It'd be underwater. And we, logged all the trees off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Industry, probably a place like Minneapolis up there. Right. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I was involved in the, some construction on the island and restoration and so forth. And, um, and it's been many years, so I think it was 2004, something like that. But, uh, what is the update on the on some of the buildings there now? They did a complete restoration on uh, Ober's house. Isn't that right, Jean? And we just finished last year. Yeah, yeah last year. We were year trying to then. keep it the way it was. And that's not easy to find cedar slab now. Can we go back to okay. Ober's house? Yeah. Cedar wood was got by taking the first four sides yeah. off. Then we used the slab, cedar is a Ober's house. Yeah. yeah, so this is Ober's house, and they just redid the whole, whole chimney, chimney, which was an extraordinary um, undertaking. Yep. And yeah, and, and the uh, man who really led the group, he had grown up in that area, so it was really kind of like going back to his childhood. But it was a labor of love. Yes, the island, while I was there, we were able to get it as a National Historic Preservation Site, and that meant that when we chimney wasn't working. We had to take it down stone by stone and number it and replace it exactly the mm -hmm. way it was there. Yeah. And what are the needs now for construction there? Anything anything coming up? Um, we we, we did we did restoration on Cedar Bark, restored the roof there and then mm -hmm. we rebuilt artist house and then um, well as you something. know all buildings have about a ten year cycle and maybe it's hard to find workers like me who will try to do it the way it was done. Perhaps mm -hmm. I want to make it better. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Don did the, uh, some restoration on uh, the Wanigan. Right. The, uh, the foundation on that. Because we had some bureaucrats. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. and I, I couldn't go up there to borrow from my jacks. You don't mind that. Mm -hmm. it's a, it, it has so many lessons to learn by just letting it alone and learning it. And that's very hard for us. We want to fix things. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's the way we are. We want to fix it. Mm -hmm. And we want to make it easier to do. It, it was a constant fight to not bring water into the Wanigan. Mm. You could put a tank on top, Gene, and then you wouldn't have to carry the water from the pump, pump, house. The pump house. Oh, well, yeah. So you don't like pumping the water down there? No, it's slow. <laughs> what, do you do while, what do you do while it's coming out? Well, I stand and look at the lake. Is that hard? <laughs> well, I suppose it's all right. And listen to the white throat and sparrow. But it's so much water. I said, did you learn anything from that? Uh, yeah. yeah. A lot of water. Could you use less water? Oh, well, yeah. Uh -huh. You know, there's so many. Mm -hmm. You just have to be attentive. Mm -hmm. What's the other building that was? Like, from the the birdhouse. Bird, <laughs> birdhouse. 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 Yeah. Uh, birdhouse has been kind of, well, made barren because we've had storms that took down all the trees around. Yeah, that one. 
That's that's where I, I said perched in birdhouse. I was Darwin taking a nap. stayed in there. Yeah, I stayed once on the, the top floor, and you do feel like you're up there with the birds. Well, Go ahead. You do because and you can see those little props on the side, and then there's some. There are cables holding it in place too. When uh, my room buddy was on the lower levels, when he would just shift in bed, <laughs> I, feel, I could feel the building. <laughs> 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 yeah. Yeah. And How tall is that? That building has a lot of props. Yes. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah, at least. Yeah. It's tall. I'm about 60. It's pretty tall. Certainly 50 at uh -huh. least, yeah. Because if you measure how many door heights there it is. There used to be a, a trap door on top. There is, but we shut it because people kept going up and walking down the roof. And Ober would, was uh, sought after as an eligible bachelor for a while. And women would chase him across the lake. He'd go up to the top and lie down on the Jean <laughs> <laughs> has lots of stories. <laughs> That's great. He would probably be dismayed, but yet not shocked at some of the arguments that are still going on up there. Oh, oh yeah. The oh yeah. The yeah. The same. The same. The same. The same. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Different enemies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the wilderness um, area. Uh, you know, they want to. Uh, the Trump administration and who it knows people want to withdraw all the protections, and they're talking about logging and mining, and you know, <coughs> either either in those areas or right over the border, of those areas that used to be protected. So um, I'm not sure what they'll win that argument. Yeah. The BWCA over in the area near the Alabama course. Yeah, and that was one of the motivations. Um, I've been there two other times, but I've never given a presentation. But Emily and I feel like we, as I said at the beginning, we want more people, people who have gone there, that we need to invoke his the spirit of Ober to um, take a stand for the environment because, you know, it's, it's not over. We need to do whatever we can. Um, sing about it, write about it, uh, share with other people, send money in, whatever it might be. Did you want to say something, Darwin? Well, I would, I would just say the polymet thing is just a huge concern for yeah. many of us here. And yeah. My sister's in Duluth and really involved in working to, to stop that, but one of the big cries is jobs, jobs, jobs. Well, there are tremendous opportunities for uh, sustainable energy jobs mm -hmm. that produce more jobs than mining a one-shot thing. And um, like I say, we just need to push for that kind of stuff, too. So. Mm -hmm. There's never been a mine that's not contaminated. Yeah. There's never been one. Yeah. Especially yeah. a copper mine. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, I went home. I was born in Eastern <coughs> Wisconsin, over in northern Wisconsin, and my mother, took, when I was a young person, my mother wrote a letter and said, "They're going to, the Connecticut Copper Company is going to build a mine, and they're going to dig a mine in Ladysmith, and they're going to move the Flambeau River." And I said, "They're not moving my river. That's my river. They're not moving it." So I went home and coordinated the writing of the environmental impact statement. Held them off 20 years, but they they buy it. They buy the mine. Mm. They, they they don't you know they have generations of they don't care. This has been one person's lifetime. Yeah. They just go ahead. So I think we'll end on a more positive note. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, I do want to um, make a segue and um, 
let you all know if you don't already know about Jim Zarzana. He's going to be giving a talk tomorrow and Thursday about the great influenza, the war everyone lost, um, 1918. And um, he, his father, Jim's father, was five years old when Jim's grandfather, a Sicilian immigrant, um, died young, healthy, hearty man in his 20s. So Jim's been personally impacted by that, but he's also um, a history buff and has done a lot of work on this. And do you want to say anything else, Jim? Well, the give the times and places? I, mean, I think the title captures it. Uh, in 1918 uh, and, and some into 1919, uh, worldwide 100 million people died in about a 16-month period. World War I killed 5 million people. Uh, I mean, so it's a devastating disease, and for whatever reason, the, the people who died the most and the quickest, I mean, we're talking about people dying within 12 hours, uh, were 20 to 40 years old, and the influenza usually takes the very young and the very old, or the people who are already sick with something like TB or AIDS or something, and uh, this, this was wiping out the young, healthy people in a way that they, they never fully, still to this day, fully do not understand what happened. And protecting the environment, significant, we have to do it. Trump is suggesting defunding the CDC, especially the part that studies worldwide infectious diseases. Uh, and so this stuff could happen again and the United States would just be wide open to uh, not knowing anything about it or doing anything to prevent it. So viruses, uh, uh, the only purpose of a virus is to find a host, replicate, and die. And if the host dies while well, it's doing that, it doesn't give a damn. You know, as one, as the world leader of viruses, uh, uh, Professor Oxford in London says, you know, they just want to replicate and die in a host. Jim, could you tell them the days? Um, I mean, the location. Tomorrow at noon on the campus in CH201, uh, and then back here in this very room Thursday night at 6:30. And he has a wonderful PowerPoint as well. So, any other questions or kind of wrapping up here? Oh, did you want to say something else? No, I said thank you for the show. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. So, thank you all for coming. Thank you all appreciate for coming. It. Really appreciate it. <laughs>